Let me start the recording. Um, and okay, uh, Reno, feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go through a PowerPoint. And uh, if you were at the last one that I spoke at, um, it's going to be look somewhat familiar, but there might there's some a few things added on here. So I'm going to share my screen to my presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. You see a PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. And I just have to start the PowerPoint. Hold on. There you go. And from the beginning. All right. So um, that is me. That's my creative side. So I consider myself a creative. So I have two sides to myself, creative side. And then there's my professional side uh, where I work a, uh, I used to uh, work a day job as a uh, uh, at the Board of Equalization in California. And I'll get into that as, as we go on. And I don't know why that box is there, but um, just play, play along with it. Um, so we're gonna talk about my creative side first, but let's talk about going down memory lane. So that's my family, my mom and my sister, Joanna. I think Joanna's on. Hi, Joanna, she's on the call. And uh, we grew up in Rogers City, Michigan on the right. And uh, we were born in Guyana in South America. And um, my parents are immigrants from the Philippines. They're doctors in the Rogers City, Michigan um, since the 80s, maybe late 70s. And they're the only Philippine, they were the um, one of two Filipino doctors in that little small town with a Neri family. And uh, Madeline also went to the University of Michigan. So we, we grew up together in Rogers City, Michigan. We're two Filipino families, the only two in that little town. Um, so I wish that box wasn't there, but that's me in college. The one on the left, I don't know where that is. In the middle, that's me working at WCBN 88.3 at Michigan. That was uh, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. shift. And I worked that after I DJed at Nectarine. So Nectarine, I got out at 2 a.m. Then I would go to WCBN and work college radio. And then on the right is me at Lunar New Year, one of the years. So happy Lunar, Lunar New Year, everyone. You're the ox. Hope you all had a good one. And that is how I looked. I had hair all through my undergrad. And you can see my graduation there on the right, on the left with uh, some good friends. We were heavily involved in the Asian American Association. And then my parents at with me at my graduation ceremony at the big, the stadium. And this is my favorite picks because we're all trying to look hard playing basketball um, at FASA. And there's Rochelle here, uh, who was the, I forgot was some sort of pageant or something that they had. And um, yeah, these are good memories, but you know, we did, we did really galvanize towards the game of basketball and you know, Filipinos love basketball and that's, we did, we did play in leagues. And I'm not sure what this photo is from, but I see, I think that's Veronica, or I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's you, right? Here on the right? That is me. That is you, yeah, there you go. Funny. I'm not even sure what this picture is from, but we're all still trying to look hard in the 90s. So, you know, it, this is a, a fun thing because I, I think that I want all of you who are on the call who are current students to know that, you know, um, we can relate to what you're going through in college because we went through it before you and uh, you probably are doing it much better than us, but these are some of the memories we have. And then finally, I was a DJ at the Nectarine um, on Thursday nights for about two, three years, two or three years. And um, like I said, I would go to the radio station afterwards and work at WCBN for the three to 6 a.m. shift. And then on the left here is our house in Rogers City in 95, a couple of years, we would go up there and uh, just have a good time out, up at the house, enjoy nature. And uh, you see uh, Veronica right here. I think you're, that's you, right? That's me with the fro. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> Trisha, I was trying to track down pictures of you and I couldn't find any, so I apologize, but um, I'm sure we'll be able to find those down there. That's road. okay, because I'm sure they were only embarrassing. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So uh, I was pro FASA president. I think the the um, the biggest accomplishment I can think of was uh, in '94 when we brought Enfia to Michigan and we hosted that. And we didn't have social media. We didn't have any of those things. We just did the best we could. And um, I'm not sure if this theme would fly today. The theme says "Sign of the Times: Merging Cultures." That was the theme. So I think that's outdated, possibly. I don't know, everyone can have an opinion on that. But it was um, the first time we had a, a national Filipino conference, uh, conference that brought in Filipino Americans from other schools and other uh, localities besides just the Midwest. And that was in August of 94, a lot of late nights. And um, I'm sure you can all relate to that, right? And um, because I was so involved, um, I was able to achieve the Lifetime Achievement Award APA community in 1996. So that was a really nice recognition from uh, from the a Asian Pacific American Task Force. I'm not sure if they're still around, but um, they were really a, a, a nice conduit for all the Asian American or organizations to work together. So uh, after college, I got my English and communications degree and I worked for a record company called Classified Records in the Bay Area. And it was a Filipino American owned record label and um, we promoted primarily Phil M artists back in 96, 95, actually night before that, 93 to 2000. And I came on board in 96. So some of the artists, Jocelyn Enriquez, um, Pinag singing group called Pinai from Berkeley, uh, R&B group called Drop in Harmony from Daly City an alternative band called Julie Plug. And my favorite song ever, if anyone knows me, is a song called Devoted by Julie Plug. Yes, Devoted by Julie Plug. That's my plug. That's a joke. Yeah, okay. Devoted by Julie Plug. It's one of my favorite songs ever. And uh, Latina artist MG, What Do You Remember? And Sweet Honesty. So the, the record label's um, genre was dance music and and uh, Filipino American community, Phil, Phil M artists. Uh, we also worked with Kai and One Voice who weren't part of the label, but we worked with them in the community also. Um, not sure if you've heard of these groups. I wish I was there in person. I would ask for a raise of hands of who've, who has heard of them, but the, this was part of a Filipino American scene I was really proud to be part of um, because it was really the first time there were any artists of our background who were trying to make it mainstream. Um, and there was no TikTok or any of the ways to promote yourself. This was before American Idol, before all of that. So we had to get, we had to grind and, and get the word out and have them tour at clubs and tour across colleges. And uh, I look at this time as a extension of my college experience because I was so heavily involved in the Filipino community at U of M. I just extended it for a few years by working for a record label. Uh, this is the Serenade compilation uh, that also featured other Filipino American acts. And here's some photos of that time. There's me on the left with the big pants and the big big jacket right here. Um, that's me with Maribel who went by MG. And uh, this is us in New York City with the singing group Penai. And that's Fine Conference 1998 with um, my friend Jeff uh, we would go to all the Filipino community events and table as classified records. Um, and then I started my own record label and uh, promoted music by um, an artist named Molly Sa, who is mixed Native American, Thai, and Hmong. And uh, that's the famous Brooklyn Bridge behind her in New York City. Um, and that was, she. we put out some her, her first album, her only album called Reminisce. And uh, that was actually a song I wrote also. And then I also put out music by a Filipino American uh, dance artist named Michelle Alvin Dia. And my record label is called Rhythm Drive Records. And it was an extension of what I learned from Classified. Um, but then I met Lin Lynette at Classified and she's on the call. Say hi, Lynette. Um, and this is us at a October um, party for Halloween. And um, we got married in 2000. And uh, we have three kids, Noah, Raylan, and Alyssa. So my whole life is, is focused on making sure um, they're taken care of and 
Um, we live in Mountain House, California. There's my, we're at the Harry Potter theme park, Harry Potter at Universal right there. So I, that's my butter, butter beer that I'm holding. Um, and then those are, uh, that's Noah and Raylan playing um, in the basketball photo for their high school. And that's us in 2021. So, um, so again, there's two sides here. Uh, I showed you my creative side on the right side, but I also wanted to address that guy on the left, um, professional Reno. So I have two alter egos always going back and forth with each other. Um, and this is what my resume would look like, is, looks like for that side of me. I'm currently a supervising property appraiser for the Board of Equalization. And, um, you know, that's something that we all have to put together as a, a resume, right? And, um, you know, the whole theme of this workshop is how has our Filipino identity affected us in the professional space? So in my creative side, it's really defined who I am through my novel, through my uh, participation in the Phil Am music scene. That is everything within me trying to connect with my culture is connected to my creative side. Um, and then my professional side here is something that you put a resume together based on your degree. And in this space, it's a bit different. These are the people that you typically see at the head of these companies. Um, do you notice anyone of any other ethnicity in there? No. So, <clears throat> This is typical what you'll experience if you go into, corp into the corporate world is this is what you are um, uh, the manager, even higher than that, the CEOs, supervisors, they're all gonna be of this background. So I wanted to address this concept of code switching that I've had to go through and um, um, you know, in my professional career, you see the definition there. Um, in a paraphrase, originally it was developed in linguistics, people going between two languages. Today, it's broadly described to adapt and how we adapt our language behavior actions to the dominant culture. So people in the corporate world, maybe tech world, they have to sometimes adapt how they act um, in order to move up and have a job and uh, continually to move up. Um, I can't, the only Filipino American I can think of that is uh, at that level of a CEO is the co-founder of Snapchat. But other than that, um, most of the people of our background are gonna be support staff. So uh, this is me uh, with my staff. Um, that's me as Pac-Man. And we dressed up in Halloween and there were, my, there were ghosts. But you can see there are a various array of colors of ethnicities, but um, I'm, in this case, I'm a supervisor, they're my staff, but then above me are people who are not of my background, who are more of the dominant culture. And then this is uh, also them taking it out on me. Um, again, we're a wide array of colors that reflect the general population, but then above me are people of the dominant culture. Um, so that's something I wanted to touch base on, and I'm sure Trisha and, and Veronica will be touching base on that also, uh, but if you go into the corporate world, you're going to have, you're going to encounter most likely um, some sort of code switching. You probably do it already, depending who you're talking to, parents versus your friends, and forth and jargon. Um, but um, it's important to know that when you are in the corporate world um, or in a professional job setting, people of our background are typically support staff. You see that even in medical field, you'll see a lot of nurses who are Filipina or Filipino. I see some doctors, of course, obviously. Um, shout out to Paulo Aquino, who's a, um, a surgeon over in Fresno, who's from our generation. And um, uh, the fact is, is that's what we're facing. But I'm very confident that your generation will break that mold uh, because you're much smarter than we were at the same age. And um, you, you do your research and you understand uh, and ask questions on what you need to do in order to move up within an organization. So my goal and my hope is that this generation will just be much better than ours. And then when you're in our spot, 20 years from now, you'll be saying the same thing to the generation behind you to make them even more empowered to, um, to run their own companies and be at the top of these companies. 
um, that's my goal. And uh, I, I hope, hopefully you understand the two sides of me. Um, again, there's my novel that I'm promoting right now, Enlightenment, the Bahala series. That's the creative side of me. Um, I'm working on book number two. So hopefully that goes well. I have lots of debates with my editor. So that's, that's a fun part. And um, it's called An Engaging Fantasy Whose Romantic Arc Will Likely Divide Readers. So check it out. And on social media, I'm Reno Writes on all of the social media stuff. Um, so that's going to conclude my uh, sharing of my screen. I'm back. And hopefully I'm within the time limit, Sean. Oh, yeah, you're good. Thank you, Reno. OK, good. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I, I wanted to, I know Sean wanted me to talk a, a little bit more about um, just my creative side, me starting my own record label, but um, I think it all kind of is encompassed in my creative side and what I've done on that end. Um, whenever someone on the creative side is pursuing that, that's the question as parents that we have is, do we tell them to gravitate more towards the traditional roles or fully support them in their creative endeavors and uh, my take on that is that I'm going to support my kids and whatever they end up doing fully and not try to influence them in a way that makes them maybe uh, not go for it because you're at the age where you should go for it. You're at the age to explore what you want to do. I'm sure all of you are unsure what you want to do, even though you say you know you want to do. Um, I know people who've switched from medical field to creative arts, liberal. And um, just know within our professional lives, our background does affect us because for myself at the time, I didn't ask enough questions. So hopefully all of you ask enough questions. And I look at myself and what I was trying to do. I'm a five foot three Filipino guy who is trying to make it creatively and professionally. But when people see how we look, there is a preconceived uh, bias that people will have. And the trick is trying to figure out where they stand within that bias. And um, I've experienced within the professional side that I've been passed over for promotions. I've been looked at more as support staff. My opinion is less um, regarded in meetings. So I have to continually fight for that uh, prominence and that my opinion does matter. And um, I, thought, I thought at first it was just me, but it was a little bit more than that. So um, other than that, I'm gonna conclude my part of it and please enjoy uh, hearing from Trisha and Veronica. Yeah, thank you, Reno. Um, and again, if you have any questions for Reno, um, last 30 minutes or last 20 to 30, but all right, Trisha, you can go ahead. Okay, sorry. And now I can't figure out how to take my clapping thing away. This <laughs> is fine. <laughs> um, I'm not, I, I teach online, but I am not, a, we don't use Zoom, so you're gonna have to forgive me. All right, share my screen. Here we go. All right, I think you should be able to see that now. Yeah? Okay, I'm gonna present. Okay, I do have an interactive thing. I am not sure if this is going to work or not. So let's see, how many Filipino teachers have you had? Okay, so this is not gonna work, so it's fine. Um, I just want you to answer this in your head or you could put it in the chat if you wanted to. But if you think about how many Filipino teachers have you had? And that should be maybe a quick answer because I know my answer is one, Dinang Weller, who I had at the University of Michigan when I took conversational Tagalog. Um, I, I don't, I can't even see the chat anymore. I feel like such an old person right now. It's terrible. Um, okay. There's a lot of ones and zeros. I don't, okay. <laughs> I can't even see it. Where is it? This is horrible. You're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. And then the other question would be how many Asian American Pacific Islander teachers have you had? So let's go a little broader, right? And then uh what do those what do those numbers look like over there sean <laughs> uh bigger uh Bea said six okay Bea, but uh, no okay. a, a lot of people are less than Bea. <laughs> okay all right <laughs> and have you ever thought about going into or would consider teaching why or and yes or no 
be on, it's okay. I'm expecting to see a lot of no's. It's okay. Because I would have answered no if um, I was sitting in your shoes. So I have any more, much more than half. <laughs> like oh, a lot of people saying yes. yes. Excellent. Okay, good. Yay. All right. So good. So this is this is for you and for all the for all of you who um, have not considered it, but might, because we always need better teachers. Although I will say that I, I share that with a caveat because right now being a teacher is pretty terrible. Okay. Um, all right. So my story. So I just want to say too that I didn't talk to Reno before ahead of this, but I really enjoyed seeing all of the connections. We kind of approach it from the same way and just start with who we are. This is my story. Um, this is me, my family. That's my husband, Brian of Barbie, who is also a Michigan alum, same year. Um, these are my three boys right here. These are my parents. Um, this is actually in Boracay in the Philippines last summer. It was the first time that we got to go to the Philippines as a family. Um, and it really meant a lot to me to bring my parents, to bring my boys there with my parents. This, um, of course, you know, that's my family now. So this is last, or not last year, but two years ago and at this point. And here's my first trip to the Philippines. And as you can see there, I think that was, that might have been in Bagno. I'm not sure where that was, or Subic Bay, a place that doesn't exist anymore, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then this basically summarizes my relationship with my brother in many ways, because he was always, well, let's just say this, I could have been a better sister, okay? So, um, but there's, you know, just me in a nutshell, as far as my personal life. But I also wanna tell my story in housing. And so this is the first house that uh, we lived in. This is a, you can see here, it's a row house in Philadelphia, North North Philadelphia, and I believe it was this one on here. Um, when I was five years old, we moved to the suburbs, um, and this is the house that we moved to in the suburbs. Um, and it was about uh, about 20 miles um, west of Philadelphia. And then here is the house we then moved to again when I was in um, fifth or sixth grade, um, and we moved maybe about another not very far, maybe only five more miles. Um, but when you look at these three pictures and the story in houses, you can ask yourself, you know, what do you see? And one interpretation is you might see the quote unquote American dream, right? This idea of moving from one house to a bigger house to an even bigger house, right? This is actually still the house that my parents live in. Um, and this American dream was really, again, driven by my family. So. Um, when the election happened in November, I was very, um, I was lucky to be quoted in an article about Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. And I shared this photo of my mom um, with the newspaper or with Business Insider. And just talking about how much she meant to me. And this, it's interesting what the reporter quoted that I quoted my mom as being very strong will, right? Because one thing that I learned from a very early age is that as a daughter of immigrants, you come to this country and you work hard. My mom always reinforced that if you can do anything that you put your mind to, period. There's nothing you can't do if you put your mind to it, right? And that really stuck with me. Um, and so I owe a lot of my story to her. And when I shared this idea of like houses, I shared it also because it's our homes that we learn our, that we learn from our first teachers, right? And our first teachers are you know, our family. So if I think about what is my job, what is my profession as a teacher, I learned how to be a teacher from my family. Um, and when we think about homes, and if you just think about your home, you can imagine like where's the set, you know, Filipino home, the kitchen, you know, and you can smell like, I can have, I smell those smells in the kitchen. And my, I have those sounds of my mom in the kitchen you know, with her knife because she was always cooking, never sat down. Only now when she's retired can she sort of sit down, except she's still cooking things and bringing them over to our house, right? Um, so what did I learn from my mom? So I learned a lot of lessons about what it means to be generous, what it means to be giving, what it means to raise children who can achieve their dreams and follow their dreams and be good people. But I also learned other things. So when I look at these houses, right? This is another thing that I want to unearth as far as something that I learned. And I, I share what I learned because I think it's important that who I show up professionally is not really separable, inseparable from who I am personally. Okay? So that's why I'm spending this time here. So if you look at the data that's here, this is um, racial data, demographic data. 
So my first home in Philadelphia, white on um, this yellow box here, the majority, that says black alone. That gives you the racial demographic of my first house. Asian is right here in a little like sort of blue purple. Here's white and lavender, two more races and Hispanic. So this is in Philadelphia, first five years of my life. We move 20 miles west, and you can see the racial demographic there, and how white alone is now 75% of the demographic, right? And black is much smaller, and right? almost like a reverse. And this here, notice again to any patterns, um, is where my parents moved and where they still live, right? And so we look at this pattern and I think about, remember how I framed it earlier, that this was the story of an American dream. As a daughter of immigrants, this is the American dream. What does it mean that my American dream demographically, racially looks like this, right? And I wish I could say that in reflecting on this that I've made maybe different choices, but this is my house where I currently live. And I put it right on top of where my parents live because I only live a mile and a half away from my parents. So this is still the racial demographic that I have chosen to raise my children in. So that's something that I think about. This was um, where I went to school, Catholic school. So remember that when it was time for me to go to school, um, my parents said we need to move because we need to get a good education. So one of the things that I learned was education was really important. But when you look at this picture, I knew there's me right here, St. Luke's. I clearly for, didn't know, or my mom didn't know that it was picture day. So I'm wearing my uniform and everyone else got to wear like, like <laughs> other clothes. Um, when you look at this picture, right? It's kind of, it, it reminds me of the picture that Reno shared about his, you know, who he works with. You know, what do you notice and wonder and who is present and who is missing? And what did I learn about who is worthy of an education or a good education? when I think about my story and who I'm surrounded by. So most of my K through 12 schooling, uh, I wanna bring in W.B. Du Bois here, was really through this lens of a double consciousness. I was always seeing myself through the eyes of others. There was me, how I saw myself, but then I was always seeing like, how do I appear to other people? And I think it's true that kids, no matter what age you are and no matter what race you are, and especially teenagers, because I teach high school, so I know a lot of teenagers, who are not much younger than you, um, there is self-consciousness. But I think when you are not white in the United States, when you are instead part of the global majority, but the you know, you know people of color in the United States, you always tend to look at yourself like the code switching, what Reynald was referring to, through the lies of the dominant culture. Then I went to college. I don't have as many pictures as Reno does. I just pulled up three. I went to college and this is my first college picture because it was November of my freshman year, I believe. Um, and these were my two, two of my best friends who lived on the same floor as me, Mark Lee. I don't know everyone is, you know, Mark Lee, Woo, Blagden, it's Blagden, okay. Um, and this is just a few years ago. So like all of these people are, well, not all of them, but many of them are Michigan alum. We had a, um, we gathered together um, almost every year uh, at a memorial dinner. This is my, you know, wedding picture. All mostly many, at least more than half of the people here are people I met at college. Um, and then, actually, let me go back for a second. When I think about college, I think about how that was a really racially and culturally affirming space. Because it was the first time that I was really, I was like really the first time I was around Filipinos who weren't related to me, <laughs> so, to be very honest. Um, and it, it was a place where I didn't have to pretend, I didn't have to code switch, I could be part of all these groups and clubs and activities. It was very culturally and racially affirming. And then I went to work, and that's what work looks like, which reminds me of what school looked like, right? And so I do think about the ways I fit into the space. I have nothing against these, you know, these are all my colleagues lovely people, look, it's a t-shirt. We did a teacher thing and made t-shirts, right? And um, lovely people, but this 
is also a space where I've had to sort of be a little, known that I had to be a little bit different. In the United States, there are 1.7% of teachers are Asian American, 1.7%. The population of Asian Americans in the United States is about six, a little six, more than six, less than seven, almost 7%. So we are, we are actually underrepresented, proportionally speaking, in the teaching profession. When I think about that, I'm like, how did I think to even become a teacher, right? Like how, why did I even think that was a thing? Um, and I'm not really sure. I, I was one of those people who starts off pre-med, you know, and then find something else to do. <laughs> um, and I, now I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, but I think back to my career and I think back actually in working a lot of student groups when I was an undergrad and I just loved working with people. I didn't want a job in an office. I love the social aspect of it. And I also love to read. And then I became a teacher. I was like, oh, okay, English. And I believe in public education because that's, remember my American dream story is a story of getting to better education at every single step. So that's part of like my DNA as far as like fueling my desire to do something different and to be a public school educator in particular. All right, let's see where I'm going. So um, one thing that I want to point out, I couldn't get statistics on that 1.7 how many of those are Filipino? Like I couldn't find those, but I did find some interesting information, which is that um, with, you know, I think it's interesting the way history repeats itself because my, um, my parents were only able to come to the United States to some extent because they were engineers, right? 1965 National Immigration Act. If, you were, if, was, if they had been 10 years younger, they would have been shut out of the country. But because they were 10 years older and because the United States decided that they needed engineers and educated people from Asia, my parents were able to come. They were college educated and they could speak English. So they had two things already working for them. Um, and now that there's a teacher shortage, you've got states like Arizona who are looking to the Philippines to bring teachers over. They've actually had this program where they have this J-1 visa program. And you can see here that there were 21 teachers in 2009 to 792 in 2018 on this visa program to bring in teachers from the Philippines to teach, not just teach, um, in the United States, but again, to teach the subjects that you can't fill. So STEM fields, especially like science and math are the majority of these Filipino teachers who are coming to the United States. And you can see here this map of which states have um, Filipino teachers on J-1 visa. That's just kind of like a bigger, sort of a bigger picture sort of thing. So I thought that was interesting. So for me, I think a lot of my journey and being a professional is, is understanding that my personal and professional have never really been separate. Even when there's like, oh, I'll put on my professional self, part of who I am still shows up in that space. And part of what fuels me in thinking about who I am as an educator are my kids. And I think about how can I be the person I would have wanted or who my kids might need, right? How do I be a role model for them as a human being? And then how do, they, how do I be a teacher for them in the classroom? One thing I do wanna say is that I'm also, uh, this is one of my, uh, stay here for a second. This is one of my uh, classes from a couple of years ago. I'm not in the picture because I'm taking it. Well, there, yeah, I'm in the picture there. I think it's zooming in. Um, so you can sort of see, I'm not sure if this is racially, um, representative, it kind of is, you know, see how, you see how the Asians are over here on the side, <laughs> um, which is kind of interesting when I look at this picture. Um, I do teach at a school that is 27% uh, Asian American and a much like a little smaller population, the Filipino um, American students as well. These are the officers for the Asian American Culture Club that I help to co-advise. Um, here is, you know, you can see their makeshift sign, they're selling bubble tea on like a unity fair day and there's our track. Um, and my work as an educator has gone to do like lots of different things. So one thing I think about is how when I was in school, a lot of the stories that I read, actually, most of the stories I read were really ones that featured like white characters, right? And um, it actually wasn't until I read Randy Rebuy's um, Patron Things of Nothing. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, a few years ago that I actually read something that felt really resonated with my own experiences because the main character is Filipino American. And, you know, I am a department chairperson in my school 
and the last summer we did one our school is Conestoga High School that's what where Stoga comes from and we did a one book and so one of the things that we did was we actually had the entire school 2400 kids read Randy's book and then like had discussion about it like across grade levels and like conversation and stuff and that's I got the chance to meet Randy a few years ago too so that's him right there and then my work in schools also looks like this because I think sometimes I know I had an image of teachers like, oh, I stand in the classroom, I give out grades, and then like, you know, I'm just this person who's just like talking. So what if there's one thing that I want to convey to all of you is that teaching is so much more than that. Because I get to work with all these amazing kids here. And this is actually a group called SOAR, Students Organized for Anti-Racism. I'm one of the um, faculty advisors, and here's a training that we were doing. You can see here, like some of the talking about stereotypes and thinking about the ways in which, you know, our identities are impact the way that we navigate the world and so on. So that's part of my work. And part of my work, I really see as being rooted in a tradition of Asian American activism. There's, I, I can't think of any, well, there are many careers, but education it is inherently an, an activist kind of career and path because Think about what you're doing. You're shaping minds of the people who come next. You're, you're helping prepare people for the world. And one of the things that I learned when I was at the University of Michigan was how much I didn't learn when I was in high school. When I got to U of M, I learned about people like Grace Lee Boggs, who actually got to meet when I was at U of M as an undergrad. I learned about Yuri Kochiyama, who has a lounge. Does she still have a lounge in South Quad? I don't know, but I was there for the naming. It was very exciting. Um, and then I also learned about Larry Ikmon, and I learned about how he worked with Cesar Chavez, and I learned about being in community with other people of color. And these were things that I did not know when I was in high school, but I only started to learn when I was in college. And then I started to educate myself more about that history. Because think about how much Asian American and Filipino American history you are actually taught in school. Because I think about that a lot, because I think about whose histories and whose stories I am learning. And what does that mean for my own sense of identity and for what and who I can be in the world or what and who my children can be in the world? So I think it's important to know that this is rooted in a tradition. Because right here, you know, you have Filipino American activists, you know, um, marching alongside BLM. This is right here a local picture of a march in June, last June. Um, you can see it's, you know, during COVID because people are masked up, but this is, these are my students. There are a lot of students at my school. These are my kids who I brought along with me because I felt it was important for them to see and to understand. I mean, I don't think it's the, it's not exactly, and I can't imagine my mom necessarily having done this, but what did she do? What did she teach me? What did my father teach me? To stand up for what's right. I'm not sure that they would have been marching along here, but I also have other privileges that they didn't necessarily enjoy because they were immigrants. Right. Um, part of my work is also being a co-founder of Disrupt Text. And what Disrupt Text is, it's a, these are my co-founders right here, um, other educators from across the country. And um, the goal of Disrupt Text is to argue for and advocate for a more inclusive curriculum. One that is not just the same standard dead white males. And sometimes we get a little bit of flack for like this idea of like, oh, but the, you know, the dead white males are there for a reason, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and we can open it up to include more voices because there are more voices. There are writers, Carlos Bulusan, right? There are other writers that we can open up a little bit so that we can see and understand. It didn't, it shouldn't have taken me to seek out voices of color, especially that, my, that share my lived experience. It shouldn't have taken me to seek those out. Right. Um, so that's part of the work that I do. And so here's like an example of like a workshop that we did at a conference. You can see how many people like we're trying to transform teaching from like sort of within. This is um, a time that I got to meet Governor Tom Wolf, who's the governor of Pennsylvania. That was fun. Um, and I really think a lot about my work as being this question. What does it mean to be in community as an anti-racist person? So there's my Filipino American identity. But there's also my identity in terms of being a woman of color. How do I show solidarity with other women of color, especially Black women who do who are probably most marginalized in society? How do I use my relative privilege as someone who is not Black but also not white to be able to move the conversation so that because 
because when all when the tide lifts, right, all boats are lifted. Um, so it means you know being in community with a lot of different people across the lots of different backgrounds. It means amplifying the stories of other people. So this is a project that I do where um, we take um, people of color, educators of color, and in the month of May, every single person on here writes a blog post about their experiences, like an essay about what it means to be who they are, especially in education, as another way of amplifying voices. I'm almost done here. So when Sean originally asked the question, I made him repeat it to me a couple times. What role does your Filipino identity play in the American workplace? The, the part that kind of um, stood out to me was the idea of American, right? Because what does that mean? And what are the assumptions around this idea of American? As if, you know, because I am American, right? And so what does that mean? Well, for me, it means everything. Because who I am personally, like as a daughter, a sister, a friend, a wife, a mother, an activist, a citizen, that's inseparable from who I show up as professionally. And I think that you can see that in my work. The way I show up in the classroom with kids is also the way I show up in other spaces. Um, because it's my belief that when our values and actions and beliefs can align together, that's what living a life of sort of living into a life of integrity. I don't always get it right. It's what I try to do. So if there is any piece of wisdom I can impart on any of you, it's just to think about how you might have your beliefs, values, and actions aligned together in the best possible way to give back and to serve um, and to, yeah, to give back and to serve and to be your full authentic self um, in all the spaces that you work in. So that's it. My timer went off. That was, that was 20 minutes. And if you want to keep in touch, you can find me at just my name pretty much everywhere. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Trisha. Um, it's very rare we have um, a perspective from the education space. So um, thank you for sharing that. And um, I do know Trisha has to head out soonish. Um, if you guys, sorry, were you gonna say something, Trisha? I was gonna say, I know how these, I know how Filipino parties run. So if this is still going when I'm finished, because I have to go, I have to go do a presentation. And then after I do my presentation for this place, um, then I can, I can hop back in. So I'll okay. check. I see Alvin on here. So I'll text Alvin to see if it's still going on. If it is, I'll hop on. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. All right. So our last speaker is Veronica. So uh, go right on ahead. Hi, guys. So my presentation is going to be a little different because you're just going to look at my mug. And I am I don't have slides for you. But I am going to talk you through um, my background and my career experience. So just before I start, I just wanna say thank you to Sean for having me and a big shout out to Reno and Elisa for inviting me into this space and being able to talk about my experience. So thanks for having me. Um, and then also, I just love that I see so many people that I went to college with. I'm just gonna do a little shout out like Eric Galvez and Alvin Vorlaza and Maybe it's just those two. I don't see anyone else, but I bet there's probably other people out there that uh, I know from college. Um, so that's just exciting. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, you know, uh, well, I went to Michigan quite a while ago. <laughs> um, and so I'm a Filipino mix. Um, it's interesting because when I was growing up, I didn't think of myself necessarily as a mix. Um, I found myself as just Filipino, uh, even though my mom is mestiza, she is um, Caucasian and Filipino, she's a mix. Uh, her maiden name is White. Um, and so, you know, I just thought of ourselves as Filipino. We grew up in a Filipino community. Uh, I don't know, shout out to anybody who is from Bloomfield Hills. That's where I grew up, actually where I currently am right now. Um, and so uh, there's a strong, a pretty strong Filipino community here in this town. Um, my parent, my mother is a doctor and we did a lot of uh, events with the Philippine Medical Association. I don't know if anybody's parents or if anybody is a part of that. I see some nods. Yes, so, um, you know, we'd go to the PMA picnics every year. And then also my parents would play Mahjong every week 
with a bunch of Filipino parents. I see a lot of people smiling. I don't know if your parents do the same, but my parents are still into mahjong uh, and, and play it often. Yes, it deserves a laugh. Um, and, and so I connected with a lot of Filipino uh, people through that. Um, in our home, interestingly enough, my parents did not, uh, like we didn't eat Filipino food and our Filipino culture wasn't really prominent in our day to day. And my parents, I did ask my parents about that. And I was like, why, why was that? And their, um, their reasoning was, they were like, Filipino food has too many ingredients, takes too long, easier to broil a steak. So I was like, all right, and I, I get it. They're two professionals, they're very busy. Uh, they had four kids, I'm the last of four. So they were just like, whatever's fast. We ate a lot of TV dinners. Um, but anyway, so, you know, uh, I grew up Filipino, I believed, but even though I didn't really have, like, we, they didn't want to teach us Tagalog. And I don't know if that's still common. I felt like that was common with a lot of Filipinos I grew up with. My parents were afraid that if I learned Tagalog, I would have an accent and not fit in as well. Uh, we would not be able to assimilate as well. So we weren't even taught the language, even though I can pick it up a little bit and I can speak it very little insults only really and like minor minor little things um but so so we really i considered myself filipino but i was removed i think from my ethnicity a little bit until i went to college which is uh you know at michigan and my brother um who some of the people here uh were friends with my brother actually also that's how i met reno um uh, and Eric and Alvin uh, is through my brother. My brother was a grad student uh, finishing up grad school when I was a freshman. And I kind of decided to depart. I, a lot of my high school friends went to Michigan and I kind of took a step back from all of my high school friends and decided I wanted to explore my own ethnicity uh, and just sort of, I don't know, get out of, uh, I called it then like mainstream culture. And I just wanted to understand uh, I don't know, more about my Filipino background and my Asian heritage. And so uh, my brother was one of the officers at the time of FASA, I believe, just because every time we did a FASA event, we had to go early. He'd be like, if you want to come, if you want me to pick you up, you have to go early. So we'd go early to these events and he's like, you have to help set up. Um, and uh, so I did a lot of FASA events. Um, I also, my brother was a co-founder of the acapella group 58 Green. Um, which I think I see some nods. I think it's still around. I get some like alumni updates. And so uh, because of that, he sort of slipped me into the group. <laughs> I had no idea how to harmonize. I could probably barely sing, but uh, they just let me in. Like George and I used to like try to harmonize in the car and he'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so anyway, he was very generous. The group was very generous in letting me in because I was George's little sister. Um, and I learned to sing better there. I learned to harmonize. And, and uh, so I did that. I did also UAAO. I don't know if that's still around. Um, I see some nods. Okay, so UAAO is still, a, is still a, a, an organization. But um, it was really in college too that I got around more Filipino people. And then I realized I wasn't full Filipino. Like a lot of times when I met people, they'd be like, oh, I'd say like, oh, what ethnicity are you or something? And I'd say Filipino, be like, oh, you're not full Filipino. And, um, and I, I realized that that was true. But the interesting thing is like at that time in college, my uncle who had retired had done a whole, uh, I know we have 23 in me now, which I've actually done. Um, but my uncle did this whole deep dive into our background. Um, and, and I can actually give you my 23. And, and so what, what was interesting is my uncle did the research by phone calls and flying places and looking up historical gene genealogy records. And um, he gave us a full report. Like we had a book that told us what our background was. Uh, and then more recently in the last year, I took the 23 and me and it almost is exactly a match. Uh, like the spit that they took did my breakdown the way that my uncle did. So it's really incredible. So I'm 60% Filipino, so that's more than half, 10% Chinese, 10% Irish Scottish, 10% Spanish, 
5% Native American and 5% they're like uh, something other, like probably African and Egyptian and Middle Eastern. So, so I just thought that was really cool that what my, my uncle could do legwork wise, it, it appeared uh, just through a, a spit test. But um, so I guess, you know, for me exploring my ethnicity was really important my freshman year. I loved being around the people at FASA. Um, I found community there. I found my first friends there. Uh, and then as I, my brother graduated and I decided to sort of go back into the mainstream. Um, and I uh, actually started to join, I joined a sorority. So I was part of Kappa Kappa Gamma. I don't know if anyone's part of a sorority here or particularly that one. Um, and then I, I got really involved um, in different things. Like I, I ended up uh, auditioning for Amazing Blue and I know that's still around. So I, I got into the acapella group Amazing Blue um, and I ended up being a part of um, some other groups like, I don't know if this is still around, but Leadership. Uh, but I got big into sort of like the leadership aspect of uh, at Michigan. So I was the co-chair of an organization called the Michigan Leadership Initiatives, which was an umbrella organization that was co-chaired by a student a head student co-chair, that was me at the time for two years. And then it headed by, uh, like co-chaired with a faculty member. So the associate VP of student affairs at the time, his name is Frank Cianciola, he was my co-chair. And we oversaw all of the leadership initiatives at Michigan. And so that meant for me, I was doing a lot of um, pitch speeches or, or like fundraising and grant speeches uh, for the college and talking about the student experience. I got to go to the Rose Bowl um, and, and did some like outreach to people, which is really funny because my brother's a big, big, huge, both of my brothers went to Michigan and they're big Michigan football fans, which I'm sure we have some here. But when I got the call to go to the Rose Bowl, uh, you know, I called my brother and I was like, I'm going to the Rose Bowl, uh, like on this, they're gonna send me out there and I just have to talk about the student experience. And then he's like, that's so cool. And I'm like, what's the Rose Bowl? So sorry if everybody here is like big mission. I, I went to games, I just didn't pay attention. I didn't know what the Rose Bowl was, but I did talk about the student experience and what leadership looks like at Michigan. Um, and and I, just, I, I just, you know, the, the funny thing is I just, I felt like I really loved my time at Michigan because it gave me a, a, like a free palette of just being able to experience so many things and also go as far as I could possibly go. Uh, so like if I had, so I actually created this diversity initiative when I was a freshman, I, I, I and I, I stayed working in diversity initiatives throughout my whole time at Michigan, but you know, I just thought it would be interesting to explore diversity the way I did it freshman year, but in a living and learning community. And I created a proposal and that got passed. And I think it actually, the, the diversity living and learning program still exists to this day. But, you know, that that's to me something that really blew my mind at Michigan. And what I would encourage for you guys to do is like you, I had such support to just create and make things that I thought should happen. And just by you know, doing due diligence. Uh, people open those doors for those things to happen. And I got champions and people to stand behind um, these kinds of things. So that, that was my Michigan experience. I, it was incredible. And I, I hope that your Michigan experience is either that for you or that you start to, uh, just from what I'm talking about, just start to look and look for these opportunities and these allies and these people who can help you build the kind of college experience that you wanna have. When I graduated, I got a job in technology consulting at Anderson, um, and I loved it actually. Um, you know, but after my first year, I, pretty, I got staffed like like I didn't even get to go to orientation. They staffed me on a project right away, um, and then within like four months, they were already letting me self manage. Which, if anyone works in consulting, it's sort of weird because. Uh, they were just like, oh, you just, just, you know, you set up your schedule and your timeline and your whatever, and you'll just do the deliverables. And I started moving up quickly. And I just realized I was working 16 hour days, but I just didn't love it. And I just started to think like, what, what could I do with my life? If I put that much effort into something and could succeed, what could I do that I would love? Um, 
And so I went to an open call for rent. <laughs> we'll just fast forward. And um, I booked the national tour of rent. Uh, and I would just say, the, I mean, well, first of all, 58 Green and, and Amazing Blue helped me develop a voice. Uh, and also because we're Filipino, I'm sure we all sing at parties and sing a lot. Um, and, and Rent is actually the kind of show, if, ever, if anyone's seen it, it, it's just really raw. Uh, it's like a kind of, you know, it's like you don't need like a professional Broadway voice to be in that show. There's just a really like kind of youthful energy to it. So anyway, I booked the national tour, Rent. I, um, and I became an actress. And uh, from that, I did Miss Saigon after I did Rent. And then I did a couple other musicals like Spelling Bee. I don't know if people know that one. Uh, but then after I just traveled a lot around the country and I just felt like it was too much traveling. So I came home and then I started doing TV, uh, started doing commercials and voiceovers. My first voiceover was a Filipino accented voiceover for Western Union. I don't even, you know, it's so funny is I just called, I, I got the audition and somebody, you know, a manager who I started to work with was like, do you have a Filipino accent? And I was like, mm, sure. <laughs> and they, they're like, great, you have this audition. And I called my parents, but I couldn't get them on the phone. I wanted to just hear the Filipino accent again, just a refresh. Then I called my brother and I was like, uh, I'm going to an audition for a Filipino accent. Can you kind of do it? And he was like, uh, uh, no, he's like, well, just, just practice, like just do it. And, and I'll listen. And, he, and then I did it and he was like, you sound French. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. And then I was like, well, let's just see what happens. Anyway, I get in the room and I, I, I did it to the best of my ability. I think it was something about, you know, sending money back home to my family, you know, for cake because they needed to eat something and they wanted food and I booked it. So it was my first voiceover. Um, and that just sort of transitions me into one of the things that I think is, uh, so first of all, my parents were not thrilled that I became an actor, um, even though I was working. I was a working actor, which was like, it's, it's a very kind of, they always say at any point in time, there's only like 5% of actors that are working. Um, but the thing is, is that I, I was working. Uh, and I would say this, this is kind of, um, when, when we talk about Filipino heritage and, and Sean's question about how that plays into your, into your, uh, into your, into the American workplace, I, my parents are just such hard workers and they work. I, I mean, I, and I'm, as I'm sure all of us come from like an immigrant experience where people work hard. Uh, and for me, like 16 hour days, that's a normal thing. And, and I think that really translates. So yes, in, when you get into the room and you audition for things, you do have to have, oh, don't quote me on this, a modicum amount of skill or like you have to have some skill in presentation. I, I agree. Great. But like a big part of that is being the kind of person that people can rely on, that people know will show up early, will do the work and, and are capable. And so that has, while I get auditions and I get into the room, I think a lot of times I make people feel safe in that I will do the work and I'll, I'll work to the best of my ability. Um, so I did, uh, you know, commercials and, um, so I did not make a slide presentation. I don't have things, but if you look me up on YouTube or if you look me up on like Instagram, uh, there's a lot of references to the things that I've done, like a, a commercial reel, a voiceover reel, a TV reel of all the shows and things that I've done. But I did commercials and voiceovers. I still do it to this day. A lot of times uh, that's actually like my bread and butter uh, because what I did learn from consulting was you create clients. And I think this is also like, how your Philippine, my Filipino heritage translates in the workplace too, is I think Filipinos can be very, uh, like we operate. And I think it's interesting because in a corporate setting, I'm not sure it always works. Uh, however, when I was a consultant, I felt like this really worked to my advantage. So maybe it will, but I'll just throw this in. In the entertainment business, um, I treat everybody like their family. And I also, so, so it's not just about the job, it's, it's, it's largely about caring for the people. I, it's a client mentality, but it's also like a family mentality and that everybody's family. So um, I've had clients I've been doing voiceovers for and cartoon voiceovers for, for oh, over 10 years. 
So what happened in my career is I haven't had to audition as much because the same people keep using me for every job uh, and then will keep passing me along. So that's, it's kind of a rare thing in, in, in the acting world to keep working frequently. But I feel like when you treat everybody like they're your family or the people that you care about, uh, you really build these relationships. And, um, and that's a huge thing because it's also not just checking in for the job. It's for me, it's a lot of time checking in and just saying, seeing how people are, seeing what they're up to. Um, I transitioned out of commercials and voiceovers or like, I mean, I still do them, but I mostly started then doing TV and film when I took a class with the head of ABC casting um, and she put me into this thing called the ABC Diversity Showcase. And it's a thing that they hold every year. Um, it's actually the way that uh, uh, Chadwick Boseman got discovered, Gina Rodriguez got discovered, a lot of um, people, uh, there's so many others, I can't even uh, name all of them, Lupita Nyong'o. Um, so anyway, this same program, uh, I had me audition and then I booked it. And so even to this day, ABC, there's a couple ABC execs that serve as my mentor, my career mentor. Um, they mentor me in acting. So I go in. So it was actually because of them that I booked this pilot called the um, Alex Inc., which was Zach Braff's uh, pilot. He was in it. He produced it and he directed it. It didn't last. And I was uh, playing his kid's music teacher. So I didn't get to recur. But you know, that's just the, the, the instability, like the instability of the entertainment business. And then, um, so I'm still in touch with those people. My mentor, we, we talk just about career things. They've also helped me transition into more directing gigs. So last year I helped direct the ABC uh, talent showcase and, um, and I've directed a lot of things in the city, so some musicals like national tours of musicals and some plays. Um, it's not my first love. I do it, but I don't, I, you know, the thing I love to do is to perform. And um, because we've hit a pandemic uh, and most recently, oh, so, so then actually because of ABC, I booked a bunch of TV shows. Um, and that's, I, I have to honestly say that a lot of that is relationship. I do work hard, but still the same thing. A lot of it is relationship. I met people, I met casting directors. Uh, and I mean, like for certain shows, I would go in I, like blacklist. I booked a role on the blacklist. I went in 13 times. It's kind of like unprecedented going that many times and not book, but like so many of these shows, they keep trying to get me work. And I, I feel very fortunate to have these relationships. And that's, that's when you sort of, you know, build into these, uh, build in um, to these relationships with people. And it's not just about business. It's like a lot of these people are people that I, uh, like one of these casting directors made me her godmother. She was like, you were raised Catholic and she had just recently uh, married a Catholic. And so, so it's interesting in the entertainment industry, it's very intertwined. It's like, it, it does become family and, and you know, jobs get passed sort of like by relationship, sometimes by talent too, but a lot is by relationship. Um, and then I guess that brings us to now where we're in the pandemic and I've become a creator so I've written, uh, I've started to write um, and I wrote a pilot about my mother. So my mother um, is half Filipino, like I said, but she also has a photographic memory and she has just had an incredible medical career, which has largely gone, you know, uh, unnoticed. Um, and so I wrote a pilot about her coming over in the seventies Actually, she came over in the 70s and I wrote it that she came over in the 60s just because it was a cooler time period. And, I, and I, I tied it to some things that happened in Detroit, like the Detroit riots. But um, so she, uh, so I just wrote her story. It's a one hour pilot. I, I just finished it uh, like last, you know, in the last couple months and have started now pitching it to networks. So that's been pretty cool. I, in that time too, wrote a half hour uh, single camera comedy. What I mostly do, or I, I think what I'm known for in New York is comedy. Um, and I wrote a half hour comedy about my life with my husband. Uh, so it's, it's like my whole Filipino family and my Canadian white husband having to, like his, his navigation, you know, of our family. Um, and that I'm also pitching to a couple networks and have been sort of, uh, trying to get that developed. Um, 
And, oh, and the third project that I've been working on is because I've spent so much time in the Mahjong world, uh, I've, I've created a, a feature film called Mahjong Queen, which is basically Queen's Gambit, if anyone's seen that. It's like Queen's Gambit, but, the, but it's a 12-year-old Filipino girl who um, she has, <laughs> she goes, she doesn't take drugs or alcohol. She loves to eat. And so sometimes she goes into these little diabetic comas or hypoglycemic comas. And sometimes when she wakes up, teen Jesus, I don't know if you guys have teen Jesus in your house, but we always had to have teen Jesus as a statue somewhere in the, in the apartment. Teen Jesus like talks to her and basically tells her to find her quorum. Because this is just a story about a girl who has no support. So, so her parents are workaholics and, and they're not very supportive. And so she, uh, I, I just, I came up with this idea because like, if you see acceptance speeches of like Emmys and, and Oscars, it's all, they're always talking about how much support they have. And like, they, it seems like they had incredible networks. But if you think about, to me, like the story of a person who is sort of an outsider and doesn't have the friend network and is kind of a loner and, and is alone, like how does that person succeed? Or does that person just expect not to succeed? So this is my answer and my story that I wanna tell about somebody who like Teen Jesus tells her to find her quorum and she does. And her quorum is like finding in a, the quorum is the four, right? You find a four to play mahjong. So you find an encourager, you find someone with wisdom and you find somebody who is a challenger. That was just my, my concept. So anyway, I'm currently developing that. Uh, I just got accepted to a, uh, a Sundance uh, screen course uh, that I had to apply for and send like um, writing sa samples and submissions to. And so anyway, um, I'm developing that at Sundance, at the Sundance course. Um, so, so I guess, how does my Filipino heritage play into my career? I mean, that's, I'm writing the stories that I have not seen. I constantly have auditioned for a lot of things. Back in the beginning of my career, I was like only playing maids and prostitutes and just like, you know, poor people. That, that's like, that's like the, the, that would be like sort of what I would, you know, if you think about it, like rent, it's like you're a poor person in the, in the ensemble of rent in the East Village and Miss Saigon, you're a prostitute. Um, and, and so I just thought I'd really, I, I wanna tell and you know, the thing is, is in the industry, it's sort of changed slightly, but not really. And so uh, I don't know if anyone ever caught that TV show with um, Vanessa Lachey and Mark Paul Gosselier, but it's like, they represented a Filipino person and like her, the way they represented her, they said like, oh, she's gonna make a Filipino meal. And she ate soup with her hands. She's like, oh, this is what we do. We eat with our hands. And she made her neighbors eat soup with our hands, which I'm like, yes, we eat with our hands. We don't eat soup, like we're not crazy. So I've, I've really committed to just writing and telling accurate stories about our, our Filipino background. Um, and I, and there's a, I feel like there's a lot of buzz and a lot of people are very interested right now. Um, so we'll see, uh, that's my husband just, uh, my husband is also in the industry most recently, he, he has a show called Lit Entertainment News. He's one of the hosts and it's on Peacock. Um, and we were supposed, before the pandemic, we were supposed to move to LA because it's a TV show shooting in LA. And because it doesn't shoot in LA, uh, it just shoots digitally. We actually, I'm here in Michigan. We actually had the, they sent a whole studio, shooting studio. We're here at my parents' house. And he's shooting from the basement from like George and my other brother's bedrooms. Um, but so him and I have been able to take this time to create a production company. And that is sort of our goal is to, um, in a multi-layered way, one, write true stories representing Filipino culture, and then also helping Filipinos rise up through the ranks in the entertainment industry. So um, I'm a part of a lot of different initiatives. Uh, I also, the other thing that I do is I work as a set coach. So a couple of my coaching clients, now I've narrowed it down to I only coach three people. Um, they are series regulars on network TV shows. Uh, two of them, I can't tell you what they are. One of them is Star Trek. 
So I just work with uh, them on their, on their stuff. Um, but then on the side, I, since I can't coach anyone else, I, I hold a free practice group and it's mostly for uh, minorities, people of color. Um, I try to recruit mostly like minority females trying to break through in the um, entertainment industry. And so I feel like that, that has been um, a huge part of what I'm trying to, you know, um, you know just inspire is uh, working on the creation content side, but then also trying to just use whatever skills I have now to bring people up. And I guess one of the things that I wanted to share just to sort of wrap up um, my time in talking to you guys are some of the things that I wish I would have learned or known uh, when I was in college. Um, so one of the things I, I kind of gave you some of that in terms of when we talk about uh, working with other people, making them family, working really hard. So uh, I think I've already said that, but I'm just gonna reiterate. Um, every job I, I have, I put in 110% and I go, uh, and that's partly because of my background as a Filipino, but that's also my faith background. Um, so it's like working with excellence as, as if unto God. Um, and you know, my husband and I, so first of all, on jobs, I put 110% in, I'm usually the first one there. I'm the last one to leave. I'm available. I work really hard. I also caveat that because I have a faith background that I also take a Sabbath. So for me, Sabbath is not, um, is not uh, hard and fast, like it has to be a certain day, but there is always one day a week where I just don't do any work and I just trust that whatever needs to get done gets done in the other six days. Um, and that's really important to my husband and I, and I think that's something that we've um, incorporated. So if you are of a faith background, I just think that's a really important thing to, to sort of try to work towards is finding time where you just rest. Because um, I think so often the things that we do, we think we're in control of every detail. And, and I just, uh, I think sometimes you can just let that breathe. Um, and for me, the other thing is uh, that is one of the most important things is being a fan and not a critic. And I learned this a little bit later in my career. And I just think this is, this is integral to success. So often, and so I'm just gonna say, this is how I grew up. My parents were very critical. And I don't know if any of you have that experience, but like you could not get anything less than an A. B equaled bad. So my parents were very critical and they worked, they worked us really hard. And, um, and they were also just very critical of a, of a lot of things. And I think there is merit to that because what you are, you're developing your sense of of discernment and wisdom on, 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 on like levels of how, uh, of talent or, or uh, excellence. And, and that is important to have. But when you're in community with people, I think it's incredibly important to be a fan. You don't need to always voice what you critique about other people or what you see about other people. If anything, try to find the things that you love about the people around you or that you love about their work and work there because everyone's on a journey, they have a trajectory. And if you can just encourage them where they're at, they will probably get better. And the same thing I would say, you'd have to do that for yourself first is where can you encourage yourself, you know, in anything that you're doing and say like, this is, I also, there's this book called, um, I don't, oh, I don't even remember the book is, sorry, I have, it's by James Clear. And I think it's like the 1% habit, maybe somebody knows it, some, I see some nods. But essentially the book talks about just when you're making little little increments of, of improvement, really acknowledging that, not trying to go from zero to 60. And I think that's a big thing, at least for me and in, in my Filipino culture, I, I grew up around a lot of critics. And I think the thing that I really admire is I've, I've, I've learned to curate, to be around people who are very encouraging. It just, it's really important in terms of being able to embark on big things, which brings me to my last two points. One of them being um, finding your quorum, which I say uh, for the Majong Queen film, but also it's just in, in the lay person version, it's just finding your people 
and making sure that you can find people who support you, finding people who, um, you know, finding the people whose talent and, and ability and, um, and encourage, so finding your talent and the ability that also encourages you, but they also spur you on and they also challenge you, but it's, it's finding your people and not everybody's gonna be your people. Um, and I think that's just really important to identify uh, just to, so actually uh, I did think I was going into politics at one point and I spent a summer at Georgetown and one of my roommates, she worked uh, a lot with Hillary Clinton and she still does to this day. And um, she was telling me that Bill uh, and Hillary, whenever they met people who they felt like would be on a trajectory with them or would be a great resource, they kept note cards of all the people of like what their skills were, what they remember about the person and, they, and their contact information. And I mean, we're more updated now. I actually just use that for Facebook. So often people ask me, do you know someone who does X, Y, Z? And I just use Facebook often to find the people. Um, but I just thought that was really interesting of like being mindful of even right now in college, looking around you and saying like, who are the people who I want to either build into or who I can refer people to? Um, Sean was fantastic. I'm looking for someone to do graphic designing for me uh, for a film poster. And Sean immediately connected me to um, some people here in FASA who uh, have a graphic design company. You know, so, so I just say like, just keep thinking about who you, like who are your people and then who are your resources around you. And then the last thing that I would say is take big swings. Um, you know, I think it was a huge leap to leave a stable career and and become an actress. Um, but I, and I think actually every voice in my world told me not to do it and told me I couldn't do it. I'll, uh, even even so much as I was in Amazing Blue and in Amazing Blue in Michigan, I was with a lot of musical theater majors. And I went to the, when I said I went to the open call at Rent, they actually came up to me and they were like, what are you doing here? And I, and I was like, oh, well, it's an open call. Like anybody can go. And they were like, it's so weird that you think that you can just like walk up and audition for a musical. And I get it. These people had spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars to study musical theater at like, you know, a renowned school like Michigan um, and were vying for these jobs. But look what happened, you know, it, it, I think there's a sense of like, let's just see. That's also how I got into Mason Blue. I auditioned and I was like, oh my God, I'm terrible. I don't even know how to, I didn't even know how to count beats. They had this thing where you had to like count beats for the sheets. And I like was like, I don't read anything under a quarter note. So I just was like, Ugh. so, you know, sometimes you don't always know, you shouldn't always count yourself out from opportunities, take big swings. And, and I think that also goes along with being comfortable with, failure. So in my household, we were not comfortable with failure. Failure was looked at as bad. And I will say, I think failure is great. As an adult, I would, if I had kids, I would teach them to just fail, keep failing. There's this old phrase that I'm sure you guys have heard before. It's fail up. You keep, you know, trying things and, and you can fail, but like maybe your failures are like, you'll move up the ranks. So I just think there's a world in which you can feel more comfortable with failing. Um, and I, I would say at least for me, and I don't know what it'll be for each of you, but for me, that also comes back to my faith. My worth is not rooted in my work or in what I do. So I know who I am and I know who I believe God made me to be. And so I have strength in that and everything else is gravy. And so I just say, it, 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 it takes a lot to sort of make these big swings. Um, and, and I just encourage you to do it. Um, that's my talk. At the, uh, I would just say, if you wanna connect with me, I'm on Facebook um, and my Instagram is at, uh, I'm Veronica Reyes, but it's I am Veronica Reyes. Um, and if you need someone to encourage you, that is like a gifting of mine. I will encourage you because I believe that I think you know, with a little bit of hard work and faith, you can kind of do anything. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Um, sure. So, yeah, okay. So uh, officially, you know, 
7 p.m. is time, but um, I'm going to leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A um, um, just for you guys to get more perspective on anything specific that you thought um, that you wanted to ask. Um, I'll just start things out with Reno, um, and I'll, I'll ask my own question, and then Adrian will moderate um, Q&A moving forward. But um, I, I wanted to know if, um, like, do you still code switch when you talk to your superiors? or? Absolutely. Okay, and like, is it like, are you just comfortable with it, or I, I'm wondering what you what you think about that now? Because I think me being from Alabama, I definitely don't have a Southern accent, but I obviously, you know, like I I, I do talk differently when I'm down there, for sure. And I, I'm wondering if it's, I I don't even know if I think about it anymore, but I'm wondering if you ever feel comfortable or proactively try to stop. Um, it's probably ingrained in myself to code switch when I'm talking to people in the professional setting. So something I need to work on, maybe I'll learn from you, Sean, how to deprogram myself on that. Um, but, uh, luckily for me right now in my professional life, my, um, my chief is a uh, Chinese American married to a Filipina. So I think that makes a huge difference. So, you know, that they have a certain degree of understanding of your personal life and in your cultural life in that respect. Um, but I have to tell you, you know, whenever I, I come across someone uh, with a Caucasian background, I'm, I'm not sure where they stand. So I'm a little bit more guarded until I find out where, you know, where they stand on certain things. So I do code switch automatically. So maybe you shouldn't learn from me in that regard, but that's just an issue, issue that you, um, you know, it's a term that maybe you should become familiar with if you haven't heard about it before. Um, I really admire Veronica and Trisha for being less of that, as it seems to me, at least in terms of how they go about their daily. Um, so it's something for me to think about for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, so yeah, now I'll open it up to the floor. And then um, if you have a question, you can type it in chat first. And then Adrian can call on you. Or you can just unmute, either or. But, you know, first come, first serve, so. Um, I guess I have a question for Veronica. Um, and I'm kind of just sure. thinking as I go, so I'll try to like this coherent. Um, but when you say, you know, at first you were in technology consulting and you you didn't really love what you were doing. Um, did you ever try to find like different ways within that career path to like find something that you love within tech, within consulting um, before moving on, like completely switching to acting? Or did you just make that big switch like in one try before without doing anything, any, anything in between, if that makes sense? No, I hear what you're saying. I, I think I knew, I think I knew, well, did I actively try to do different things within consulting? Um, I did, I got exposure to a lot of different things and I got to be on a variety of projects and see the breadth of what I was doing. At one point they wanted to, like, I was moving up pretty quickly and going on various projects. And at the, at the point that I was leaving, which is odd, they wanted to send me to Europe to like head up this whole, European division for um, their client that was in, in Illinois, where I was in Chicago. Uh, so I did get a wide variety of experience, and I know it's only a year, but within, within um, Anderson, but it, it just didn't feel, it just didn't feel like it was something that I wanted to do. So I think I knew in my gut that no matter what facet I was doing, it wasn't going to be a fit. And, and I think the confirmation really came later in that, like, this is the career I feel I've been meant to do. And, and in this time period, being a creator, being writing these scripts and telling these stories, this feels like exactly where I'm supposed to be. Thank you. And sorry, I should have introduced myself first. Um, I'm Bea. I'm a junior business student studying marketing. Oh, hi, Bea. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I have a question. Um, this could be for any alums, I guess, or any of the panelists. Um, uh, so my name is Janielle, and I'm a sophomore engineering student. Um, and I've just always 
like this I've, I've always thought of myself as a very um uh adventurous person where I could I'm willing to like try new things um and just be be afraid you know um but it, it's always different when it comes to career and like anything that deals with the actual future stuff and um I know Veronica you were talking about like you taking a huge leap I know um uh I like it, it's just like whenever I hear talks about um like from panelists before they're, they're always talking about yeah I, I didn't like this this job and I just took a different direction and it, it ended up better for me um I guess how how would you kind of force yourself I guess to to be able to take that leap when you are afraid of like getting rid of that comfortability of safety like stability and, and things like that I could jump in. I have. I just saw Reno mute, so I can jump in. Um, so, I, so, so the more layered answer I would give for that is, um, I can only really talk from my own experience. So I would say this: one, for me, everything goes back to prayer. Um, so faith is a huge part of my life. So I, I pray, and I pray for discernment. I pray for wisdom. I pray for protection. Um, I also have people around me in my community that I that. I pray that pray for me and with me, also my husband. Um, and then on top of that, I also use a grid system and there's so many out there. I don't wanna like advocate for one, but you know, to take these big risks, I, I sometimes I catch myself in saying things that like, oh, just take a big risk. And it sounds like it's just like, oh, just do this thing. But I, just for me, I should, I should caveat that with, um, I was willing to do all the, like I had weighed out what I was giving up, what I was risking and what I expected. So it's not as like flippant and as capricious as I've made it seem. It, um, so, so there are different, you know, systems of, of how to, so if you make like, um, if anyone watch Gilmore Girls, she used to always make a list. <laughs> yeah, so I see some smiles. Um, she used to always make her pro con list. And I do sort of a version of that with weighted numbers if I'm really having a hard time figuring it out. Um, but I would say I pray first, then I make, make a pro con list, and then uh, you know, and then and then and then there just has, sometimes there's just like that that it factor of a thing where you just feel in your gut that it's something you just want to go after and try. Um, and if you're willing to do the hard work, like, like I was willing to work in a restaurant and, and do, you know, menial labor jobs to be an actress. I knew that even though I had the education to do more. So, so that is something that I knew that I was risking and I was willing to do. I was willing to put in the work. Yeah. The, uh, what I wanted to add to is that it's that gut feeling I had when I left college and went to work in the Bay area for independent record label owned by Filipino Americans. And uh, that was just a gut feeling. Now, I would go with what Veronica says more um, and follow her advice more than my experience, because my experience, I didn't write a list. I just said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go out there and I'll figure it out. And, you know, life takes so many, you know, the choices you're going to have upon graduation are going to be many because you're at Michigan. It's a great institution to to develop leadership. And um, that's what I got in my Michigan experience. So when I went to the uh, work for that record company, I really had no idea what I was doing, but I just had a feeling I needed to be part of this. So not saying that was the right choice, just saying that that is my journey and that's my story behind it. Um, but like I said earlier, your generation is much smarter than I ever would have been at that age. <laughs> and so, um, what Veronica says, write a list, look at the pros and cons, see what you're willing to risk, and then make, make it happen, whatever you choose to do, and go for it and work hard. Because I think that's what our immigrant parents have been able to teach us is to work hard. And that's something um, that you can take with you. Don't let anyone else outwork you. Um, I think, is the other question? If you would like to unmute or put it in chat. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, my name is Izzy. I'm a junior studying industrial engineering. 
Um, one of the things that really stood out from your talk, specifically Veronica, but feel free to answer, you know, if you have input as well, um, is like learning how to fail and learning how to take failure and like push past that um, and yeah, better yourself from that. Um, and considering like the high pressures that like Filipino parents often put on us um, on like not failing. Um, can you speak more on your experiences and times like you experienced disappointments or failures and how you took that um, moving forward? Oh boy, as an actor, you face disappointment like on a, on a three times a day basis. You know, if you have a bunch of auditions in a day and it's like, you just know. Um, so, so I guess what I'd say about the failure aspect. So I also love really listening to like various podcasts. One I love is Gary V. If any of you, Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't know if you, any, I see some slight nod, head nods. Um, and he talks about this a lot. And I just love this idea of failing big um, because I don't wanna keep sounding like a broken record. But like for me, my faith background is huge in that. Um, I just think life is bigger than each little achievement or thing that I can do. So that's one. But two, um, failure means you're trying. I actually would like to flip the, this is so many, I've listened to so many leadership podcasts and leadership everything. And obviously my time at Michigan was all about leadership. They didn't talk about failure a lot though when I was at Michigan. But I'm going to say this, I think the scorecard should be rack up as many failures as you can, because that means you're trying new things. That means you're venturing out. That means you're being innovative. <laughs> yeah, Gary me so a lot. <laughs> um, but that, I love that idea of, of um, racking up failures. And so I, you know what, here's the thing that I also do too. Sometimes I just, when I'm scared of things, which is often, I, I use ex life as an experiment. So I'm like, I'm just gonna experiment just for the next six months. I'm gonna, and I'll say something that I, you know, I'm scared to do. So if I were like somebody on this call thinking like, okay, in the next six months, uh, I want to understand failure and see if I can become, you know, more, more um, seasoned in that and uh, keep a scorecard or something like by calendar and mark it every time that you fail and, and celebrate it. I think like flip the narrative for yourself on failure. And, and then I want you to sort of like maybe even journal like what it's like in the beginning and what it's, it's like through the process and at the end see what you how you come out and now because it's only six months and you're in college you know maybe it wasn't the right thing for you and, and figure out why uh my background is in math i i do everything very i i, I am very um like methodical about all the things that i do so i think that's an important that that might be a fun way to sort of make an experiment out of failure i hope that's helpful Really quickly on that, Izzy. Um, yeah, I was. I, I take failure really hard, at least when I was younger. So it's something I've had to work through, in order to say it's okay to fail. So I'm trying to get where Veronica is on it um, in my journey, but I say follow what she says because um, you know um, I think with the way we grew up, at least I did, um, and I'm not sure if it was blatant or just something just in the consciousness is that. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I should fail ever. So when I did something poorly, I would cover it up or try to and just show the good stuff. I got good grades, right? Didn't want to talk about, you know, when I played basketball in high school, that I had a bad game or anything like that. Um, and um, my big swing was going to, after college, going out and working for this independent record label. It went out of business and that was hard for me to take because I took a big swing there and um, wanted that to be a success story. So um, to answer your question, um, I think it's something that, especially from the Midwest as Filipinos, we have to work through and be okay to fail in whatever you're doing. And don't look at that as a negative, as Veronica has said. I'm still working through that because 
Uh, every time I look at my book sales, I'm like, oh, okay, that's all right. It's okay. We're, we're good. So, you know, I'm, I'm like mentally coaching myself to look at the positive side of it. Um, it might just be personality too. It might just be me. Um, but within yourself, you have to have, you know, have a mentor and have someone you can talk to about what you're doing. Like Veronica has a lot of mentors she can go to. I have a few also. Um, but I'm always, always trying to uh, get past that. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, I believe Sean has another question. Sean, if you would like to unmute. Yeah, okay. So this is kind of related to our previous conversation, but um, I, I kind of want to ask something. I mean, this doesn't apply to everyone in FASA, but you know, a common thing I see in FASA is like constant comparison to uh, your peers and upperclassmen. So, um, and I think that leads to like, it's like the reverse effect. Like I, they, they, you know, a successful senior is going, you know, to this job. And instead of it being like, oh, that makes me think that I can do that. It's more like, I can never do that. Like that, that person's so much smarter than me. And I, I, uh, I, I want to ask, like, you know, that's innate to a lot of people in Michigan, I think, um, as you're constantly surrounded by very talented individuals. But um, if if you have an answer to this, I was wondering how you how, how do you deal with like that mindset um, or that idea when you know, you have a peer group or a cohort that's very successful relative to you. Um, and, you know, I myself go through a lot of mental gymnastics with my uh, like fellow PhD students. I'm like, man, they published like three papers <laughs> um, and I, I haven't done anything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do you, you know, find maybe not happiness, but I guess um, success within yourself um, if people like that keep on comparing themselves to like their cohort. I want to jump in on that just because it's so it that's such been a, a huge part of my learning in my 30s is just um, it's so easy to be jealous of all the people I mean I'm a set coach I coach actors on their they're millionaires and I coach them for the words that they say on their TV shows where they make a million dollars a year. So that feels, you know, if you talk about comparison, I almost think that it, it's like it hurts because I want to be in their position. But currently, I am the person who's helping them work on their stuff so that they can deliver it on TV. Um, and I had to really work through that. I think the first time I booked a client on a series regular on a, on a network CBS comedy, I, was, I got off the phone and celebrated with her and got off the phone and then just cried in my husband's arms for like, I don't know, probably half an hour or 45 minutes. And, and um, I would say it's, it's whatever you have to work through, but I, I just want to encourage you to remember like there's there's enough out there. There's, an, a, there's enough out there for everybody and everybody has their own path. So I just say it, 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 it might also feel unnatural to celebrate what other people do, but I think if you can find that in your heart to celebrate other people, that's huge. And then, um, and then just really taking, uh, taking an inventory of like, what are, you know, if you're doing the things that you can do, I think sometimes also people's people's successes inspires you to work harder or do, you know, change the way that you're approaching things. Um, and I like my book broken record, but also just for me praying about it and saying like, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? What 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 do you have? What is it that I can do that no one else can do? And why do you have me here? And I, I truly believe that that answer comes and and. Um, each one of you is made specifically for something. And I think it's, it's like your life journey to figure out what that was. And so, um, and so I think that's exciting, maybe looking at it like it's really exciting to discover what you were meant to do. Um, we, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So we come from Filipino parents, majority of us here, right? And um, I, I don't know about you, but um, just through hearing them talk, about accomplishments of a cousin or someone else or someone's friend who's going to a certain school, whatever it is, that has some subconscious effect on you. So I'm the parent of three kids. My oldest is 20. 
So she'd be in this group if she went to U of M. She'd be a student there with you all. My uh, my second daughter, uh, Raylan, is a senior in high school, and my son Noah is a sophomore in high school. And um, I've I've tried to work on deprogram deprogramming myself in listing their accomplishments. You won't see me post on social media about them and their accomplishments, but I'll post about them as people and the type of people they are, uh, the good things that they do to help the community or something like that. And we hardly post about our family on social media. And um, the criteria that I've tried to use for my kids is to guide them to be good people, just to be good people and the rest will fall into place. I don't care what school they go to. I'm not going to go brag to a friend that she, they're going to this school or that school unless you know, they'll ask how they're doing. But I think a lot of it is how we are brought up. The apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree. Really, it doesn't. And how we look at what's accomplishment. What is an accomplishment? That's the question. What is that? And then when you see your friends or anyone else listing these accomplishments, there's that natural tendency for us within our culture to say, well, what the heck am I doing? Or, you know, like Sean, you're feeling that, right? So um, I think it's part of deprogramming our colonial mindset. It really is. And I could go even deeper into, <laughs> into that, but, um, you know, it's, it's part of our criteria as a, within the Filipino family, what makes someone successful. So for me, as a dad, my whole goal is to try to make them just not make them, but guide them to be good people. And that's my criteria. I also want to add, I love that so much. And I think even like as a parent, that is an, an incredible way to sort of flip the script. And then as just as people, one of the things I try to do, uh, and I, I've asked like a lot of my friends to do if we have parties or things, when they meet other people, it's not like, what do you do? Because uh, that's always the question, right? So we could always flip that and just to say something like, um, and you know, dealer's choice, but uh, like, what are you passionate about? Or, um, you know, what are some hobbies that you, so, so just like get to know you questions when you're first meeting people that don't have to do with like, what is your position in life and what is your work? That way it takes the worth off of that. So that's another little thing that I think people can start to do to change conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, you know, that that question, it was on behalf of FASA, but you know, also myself. I, I definitely suffer from imposter syndrome like probably every single PhD student at this university. So um, yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, okay, so we do have a hard stop at 7.30, um, which is in five minutes, but um, before we do that, I have one thing, and for our media chair, we do and would love to take one picture slash screenshot of people who attended. So um, if you have a camera, please show it for this and smile. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> Danielle, go ahead, take it away. <laughs> All right, I'll wait a couple more seconds. Um, everyone to show their faces their lovely lovely faces okay all right in three two one smile thank you everyone yeah thank you okay so um that will conclude things for tonight um thank you all alumni who attended it is very rare that we get this much alumni or active alumni participation in our events until this year um, shameless plug, if you want to be these speakers, let me know. <laughs> um, I would love to get in contact with you. Um, but yeah, I think that's all. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I'll stop the recording right now. Thanks, Thanks everyone.